Hey, Sarah, guess what? Hey, Lindsay, what? I'm going to adapt Yarn Socks of Rising into a musical. <laughs> you mean the audio drama podcast you wrote about a Jotun giantess taking revenge on Thor and taking out her frustrations on an energy corporation in the future? <laughs> exactly. I'm thinking like La Traviata, but bouncy Ooh. and with Finnish symphonic metal. Uh, right. OK. Uh, well, can I just ask why you would want to do that? If I make it into a musical and it's a hit on Broadway, then it could get made into a movie. And since I own the IP, I'll automatically become rich and famous forever. (laughs) And as we all know, the only reason to make an audio drama podcast in the first place is to create an intellectual property that can get optioned for TV or movies by a big movie studio. Wait, 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 I'm going to have to stop you right there, Mom. Just place your hands on the ground where I can see them and those ideas to the back of your head, okay? Just stop this nonsense, will you? What? What? Okay, so first of all, you are officially banned from reading too many podcast industry newsletters, okay? Why? What did I do? Oh, John Saxon Rising is a Broadway musical. Be mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they said that about Ron Chernow's 818-page book about the first American Secretary of the Treasury, and look what happened. To Secondly, him. just please don't. No, see, stop. An intellectual property funnel to movie studio investors is not the purpose of audio drama. <sighs> then why is that the only thing we ever hear about audio drama podcasting? It's not the only thing. And oh, please promise me you'll take a break from reading podcast industry newsletters. But they're so cha-ching, cha-ching, Hollywood. <laughs> if we just think of all the kids half asleep in the back seat on long car rides and listening to that mysterious programme at the end of the dial. And just think of the kids in the library on rainy afternoons with giant headphones on and all the people stuck indoors last year who needed an escape and runners and yard workers and mums on a night feed and, and think about how audio drama can do things that other media just can't. <laughs> Fair point. Thank you. So, shall we move on? I was really excited about writing arias and symphonic metal. Welcome, one and all, to another exciting episode of the Audio Drama Writer's Toolkit. Yes, I'm Sarah Golding. And I'm Lindsay harris Friel. Hooray! And each week we take an aspect of audio drama, explain it, discuss some good examples of current audio drama podcasts and how they use this aspect, and then we give you... Yes, you lucky listener. Hello. A writing exercise that you can use to make your audio drama writing experience just... Better. <laughs> I would like to apologize for my short-sighted attitude in the sketch at the beginning. Oh, there's no need for you to apologize, Lindsay. I know, but I'd like to do it anyway in case anyone's feelings were hurt. Oh, no, I don't think anyone's feelings were hurt. <laughs> I know it's really not that important, but I do read way too many podcasting industry newsletters. <laughs> yes, you do, because, well, we both edit the Fiction Podcast Weekly News. Yes, we do. Then you actually do all the hard work. (laughs) You do the finding and I do the... You do the hard work, yeah. And... Oh, I say. There's a prevalent attitude that movie and TV studios looking for intellectual property used to be looking for popular novels or series of novels. Mm, Like Game of Thrones. Or Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. Oh, exactly. (laughs) But... Studio executives don't have time to read. Who does have time to read? Hmm? But read if the intellectual property in question is a podcast... Oh, then you can skip all that time-consuming nonsense with publishing and printing books and bestseller lists and big newspaper reviews and cutting down trees. I mean, it's, it's all very time-consuming, isn't it? Hypothetically, it's faster and easier to show proof of concept. Uh-huh. For example, hey, look at all these downloads my story is getting... To prove to some big entity like HBO that you can make money for them. Well, that's no shame in that. <laughs> Not in the least. Mm. But there are many much more important reasons to adapt a novel or a play or a screenplay or... A, a recipe. 
I once saw a performance mm. art modern dance piece that was an adaptation of Ode to Billy Joe by Bobby Gentry. Ooh. Uh, did they explain why Billy Joe McAllister jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge? No, but I did learn about, <clears throat> I'm quoting from a review, <laughs> the southern United States is imagined by an unhindered Belgian. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm quite sure he'd never been anywhere between Miami and the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> that sounds awful. I was like, but what does this have to do with audio drama podcasting, my friend? I'm going to get there eventually. I'm just trying to get you akbe on ye akte. I ye one. Let's take the most obvious example of audio drama adaptation. Oh, let's. War of the Worlds, the <gasps> 1938 radio broadcast that gets yep. trotted out every October 30th. Oh, oh. Uh-huh. We're going to link to some... We're going we're to link to a copy of H.G. Wells' original novel. Nice. And also a YouTube link to the, uh, well, a copy of the original, a recording of the original broadcast. A recording of a recording of a recording. Recorded. It's a recording of a recording of an edi- edited adaptation of a recording. <laughs> um, there's Beautiful. also a great Smithsonian Magazine article about the writing, the adaptation process. How exciting. Um, the original book yep. is about the Mars invading Great Britain yes. in the 1880s. Yes, we've just went with And <laughs> what happened is the invaders defeat the British Army thanks to they their advanced did. weaponry. Mm. But they are defeated mm. by earthly diseases against which they have no immunity. Yes. And what does this sound like? Wow. Does it sound like, you know, <laughs> Brit- the British Army going to there India and getting malaria or Ooh. going to... You know, going to Africa and dying of malaria or yes. whatever. Crazy uh, time. So the novel's a satire of British imperialism. Mm. And it's it basically the first generation of readers would have said, oh, OK, this makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, but in 1938, uh, the, the people who were in charge of Mercury Radio Theater, Orson mm-hmm. Welles and John Hausman, they thought, oh, this book is just too silly to be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. War of the Worlds by that point had been adapted for comic books nice. and children's books and all kinds of things. Yes. So there were, it, it, it was very familiar to families and mm-hmm. children. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, Mercury Radio Theater had been on CBS radio for 17 weeks with no sponsors. Oh, dear. And I think Orson Welles had a sense of like, if nobody's listening, then it doesn't matter what we do. Let's do something crazy. Let's do something so that it seems like an actual crisis is happening. He decided to dance like nobody's watching. <laughs> and as we all know... No shoes. Hmm. <laughs> and wouldn't you love to see Orson Welles dancing like nobody's I'm watching? I'm imagining it. I hope you all are now. Uh, yeah, it's a great yeah. image in that, with that hair flapping around. So <laughs> anyway, um, if you listen to it now... When you hear the opening with this mm. sort of stentorian opening that Orson yes. Welles does, it, it seems to be very implausible that anyone would have thought this was an actual crisis. It, mm. He's this very, I am on the stage acting Shakespeare now sort of thing. <laughs> Nothing and, wrong with that. Yes. But what happened is the Mercury Theater sort of accidentally, sort of on purpose, <laughs> exploited a bug or feature in how people listen to radio yeah. and how radio presented the programs. Yes. There was, the script revisions were rushed. Uh-uh. They were uneven. They were all over the place. And the result was that the script was lopsided. Um, the first act was way too long compared to the second act. Yes. So the station break in War of the Worlds came about two-thirds of the way through rather than at the halfway mark. Yes, that was unexpected, eh? So that would have been very odd to well, actually, yeah. Well, yes, because radio audiences thought, oh, on the half hour, there's always station identification. Mm. But breaking news doesn't follow station identification. Right. Mm. So people who thought the broadcast, it, basically anybody who tuned in at 8.30 yep. came in, you know, not even halfway through this yeah. fictional Mar- Martian invasion. 
Yeah. And they broke them rules, didn't they? They sure did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is so amazing and exciting. I kind of do wish I'd been alive then to be to be duped by, <laughs> by the team. Oh, you wouldn't have fallen for it. <laughs> no, I might. Because, you know, I'd have been pregnant and 22 and working in a typing pool and in need of escapist storytelling, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Bless you. Anyways. <laughs> So when this was adapted, they concentrated on craft, Mm -hmm. how the show would be presented, and let that inform the story. And in later years, although Orson Welles did apologize because CBS was sued mightily. Okay. um, But Welles, he thought it was cool, kind of like Dr. Frankenstein shouting, it's alive, before the creature (laughs) escapes and kills a little kid. Yeah. So it lent itself easily to radio adaptation because if the Martians actually invaded, it would be newsworthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, For the purposes of Mercury Radio Theater, it didn't even have to be that novel specifically. Mm -hmm. They kicked around a bunch of novels and said, oh, you know what, let's just go with this one. And they thought, kids know it. They said, we can use the radio medium to make this seem as realistic as possible because anybody who listens is going to know it's a kid's story. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Stan Freeberg made a comedy recording on one of his albums. It was the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears presented in the style of Dragnet. (laughs) That sounds awesome. It's hilarious. (laughs) Okay, but how how can we use this kind of thing in podcast adaptation? Mm. Okay. Take a look at the piece that you want to adapt. Think about why you want to adapt it and how does that fit into the podcasting medium. Mm. Uh, Orson Welles' first concern was the placement of the audience, the effect on the audience. He it wasn't even I want to do War of the Worlds. It's I want the audience to feel like something very real and very threatening. Panic. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Mm. His first concern was the placement of the audience. It puts them in the position of stay tuned to our breaking news report. It's mm-hmm. almost like, oh, you won't listen to my show? Well, you'll listen now. <laughs> um, there's a difference between the story as presented on paper and the story you're trying to tell because mm-hmm. of the combined effect of all the dramatic elements and how the audience perceives it. And also what they bring to the table themselves as listeners. Yeah. Um, in The War of the Worlds, Orson Welles was trying to say, Don't believe everything you hear on the radio, which is not the same as what H.G. Wells was trying to say, which is colonialism sucks. Indeed. And I mean, if H.G. were alive today, what do you think he would write? I mean, do you remember the movie Time After Time with Malcolm McDowell as H.G. Wells uh, and what's his name that was in Time Bandits? The bad guy, except in this one, he was playing Jack the Ripper. Oh, yes, yes. uh, The David Warner. Yes, he was also in uh, the Titanic, not the the big budget one, another one. And and loads of loads and loads of other stuff, isn't it? So remember. okay, so there's a scene where it's his first night. It's H.G. Wells, first night in 1980 San Francisco, and he has to sleep on a park bench. Oh. So he bundles up as best he can, looks at the sky and says, Utopia. (sighs) Oh, it'd probably be a a novel titled, I tried to tell you, but who has time to read? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And, you know, someone would have to adapt it for audio drama, wouldn't they? Hmm? Which, uh, Mm -hmm. which, you know, brings us back to... Adaptation. Yes, very good, Sarah. You got us back on track. Mm -hmm. So when you write an adaptation, you have to build the scene in your head and inhabit it. Oh, like a hermit. Kind of, yeah. Um, you're in Socks Arising, episode six, the wedding scene. Oh. Uh, this is based on, um, this is the big turning point in season one. This is based on a myth from Norse mythology, the Thrymskvidha. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Which is part of the Poetic Edda, which is the big book of mythology of, uh, you know, the Norse. Mm. What I wanted to say in the scene was, Yeronsaxa and Thor's relationship succeeds because she doesn't follow Asgard's rules Mm. and enables him to steer away from Asgard's rules, which is also why it fails, because he's always going to choose Asgard over her. Oh, so romantic. (laughs) Thank you. I grabbed this myth because it's memorable Mm -hmm. and because it's one where Thor is the fish out of water. He's not he's forced to not live by Asgard's rules. It's one of the most memorable Thor and Loki get up to shenanigans stories because it's funny. It plays with gender roles and it reverses our expectations of Thor. Mm. And also, you know what? Um, When we studied we studied Norse mythology when I was growing up in school. 
in school. Uh-huh. And I was kind of hoping that this would, that people would remember this, like, oh, I remember, I learned that one in school. Mm. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no. So I was just going to ask. Okay, but what's what's the plot there? What what? How does it? Thor play Thor out? wants to get his hammer back from Thrym, who mm. has stolen it. But Thrym says, "You can have the hammer back if Freya agrees to marry me." Oh. Uh-huh. So. Of course, obviously, Freya says no go. Yep. Loki gets Thor dressed up as Freya in yards and yards of bridal attire. Aww. And Loki disguises himself as a bridesmaid. Oh, I do love a bit of cross-dressing. They know those, um, those Scandies do too. <laughs> and really, who doesn't? <laughs> oh, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so they show up in Jotunheim. They agree to the marriage. Mm-hmm. Thor can barely hide his rage. Oh. But he manages to hang in there until Thrym presents the hammer to quote unquote Freya as a wedding gift. Yes. And then of course Thor grabs the hammer and starts busting heads and sing. <gasps> like the first red wedding kind of sort of just as gross. The original text is a third person omniscient viewpoint. Oh. Um it's it's a poem. It you know kind of it doesn't put you into the moment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Initially what I wanted was a tender scene between Thor and Yarn Saxa mm. that showed he was pretty much useless without her, and where she showed him that living by his family's principles was a lot dumber than living by hers. <laughs> so the scene was him telling her the story. Yep. Here's how I got my ha- I've been gone for a while, but now I'm back because I've got my hammer back, and here's how. And she says, idiot, Thrym is my cousin. You could have just told me that he stole your hammer, and I could have gotten it back for you. Uh, Thor admits he can't let a woman settle his affair for him. He's going to do what Odin tells him to do. Oh, and by the way, honey, I just killed your whole family. Isn't it great that I did that? But I've got my hammer back, honey. <laughs> Pride becomes a, a fool or, or some such. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. on stage, this gave us possibilities with costuming and lighting. Mm-hmm. But in sound, it's just talk. When I was writing this, I had to build the moment in my head. Mm. Here's this Jotun Asgard wedding ceremony. What are the priorities of the folks on each side? Yeah. How do they celebrate? Who officiates? Mm. What happens if the wedding succeeds or fails? Mm. And Jorn Saxa is this participant observer, a guest at the wedding. And this formal wedding ceremony is described as a peace treaty between Asgard and Jotunheim. Uh Jotuns don't care. They don't play by Asgard's rules. Mm -hmm. Their idea of a wedding is just to, like, eat oxen and get drunk and get crazy. That's the only reason to have a wedding. Sounds great. The Asgardian contingent is invested in rules, you know, the handshake and the the trading of gifts and so on and so forth. Asgard wants rules. The Jotuns want chaos. And Jern Sox is having a grand old time believing that it's Freya underneath the veils being humiliated for her king, Thrym. Mm-hmm. And it's all fun and games until Thor gets the hammer and pulls off the veil and then it's clobbering time. It's always the fun bit. <laughs> right. And then Loki prevents Jern Sox from fighting back and mm-hmm. hides her because Loki knows that she's pregnant. <gasps> Plot twist. Yep. When the... And when the fight is all over and Thor has killed all the Jotuns except for Loki and Jorn Saxa, she's doubly betrayed by Thor. Obviously, he's yeah. killed her entire family just to follow Daddy's rules. Oh. And by Loki, because he kept her from fighting Thor. Oh, yeah, I don't think even therapy would have helped her, to be honest, would it, really? No. One. No. <laughs> the only therapy you get then is revenge, <laughs> which is necessary. When you have a scene in something that you want to adapt, know the audience point of view. Yeah. In this case, their point of entry is with Yarn Saxa. Mm. She's the one the audience follows throughout the scene. Okay, so you know your focal point, right? You got your focus from the audience perspective. Yes. Yes. And from the character's perspective, know what the character's stakes and boundaries are, what mm. they can and can't do, what they want and need to do. Yeah. Let them act from their point of view. Don't tell us in the third person what the characters do. Have them do it. Yes, show, not tell. That should be been blazoned across every writer's desk, shouldn't it? Or maybe even, oh, should I get a, a tattoo? Not on your face. Oh, okay. Get it on your neck. <laughs> well, how would you see it if it's on your face? <laughs> you can't see it if it's on your face. Get it on your wrist. Uh, okay. Well, I'll think about it. So anyway, you're you're kind of playing with action figures here. How does each character in the scene function with and against the others? Mm. What does each one want? What do they need? What's in their way? Who or what is is helping them? And also, again, 
if you're adapting this from a novel or ancient poetry or something, if the point of view of your source material is third person omniscient, your characters are not omniscient. They don't all have the same amount of information. A lot of times you have novels where characters think to themselves about stuff for pages. Yeah. You can have those interior monologues in audio drama. Mm. An audio drama yeah. can be a good reason to have those, mm. like we talked about with blood culture. Yes, true. Um, but... They can't get pretty boring pretty fast if they go on too long. Mm-hmm. It's usually a good idea to bring in a secondary character who needs to have everything explained to them. A secondary character who needs... What do you mean, Lindsay? Exactly. Hang on, wait. Oh, am I the secondary... Oh, I see. Yes, I, I'm the... yes Sarah. Okay. The real reason the doctor has a companion is to give the doctor a reason to go into all that exposition. Oh, do I'd love to be the doctor. I'd make a great, cheeky, resilient doctor. Wouldn't I, Lindsay? Wouldn't I... I think so. Mm. I totally think so. I think you should go audition then. Just <laughs> All do right. it. Bye. Where was I? Okay. Here's an example by Craig Robotham. Uh, his website is weirdworldstudios.com. Oh, and yeah. he published an excerpt of an adaptation of the book by, oh, not not a book, a short story by O. Henry called The Gift of the Magi. Mm, I do love Craig's writing. I know his first love is OTR as well. And uh, he was actually a Quirky Voices winner a year or two ago. And you can hear some of his writing uh, brought to life in audio drama form in uh, Madcap Episode 2, which is out on the Quirky feed now. <laughs> Very cool. I'll definitely listen to that. Do. I will share and enjoy. Do, do. So it, the, the point is, is that this... In that, in the gift of of the Magi, at the opening, there's this long thing where Della is alone in her apartment, crying to herself over how poor she and her husband are Mm -hmm. and how she wants to get him a Christmas present. And it's this lonely, desperate moment in the book. In what he wrote, it's her confessing this pain and frustration to a friend. Okay. Which is great. Mm. Uh, he did a really good job with that. Groovy. Sometimes you're adapting a work of fiction for audio drama because you want to put it in a different time or place, like Cinderella in space or something. <gasps> oh, I'd love to play Cinderella in space or something. <laughs> I think you'd make a good fairy godmother. Oh, thank you. These are the, 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 the best roles, to be fair. Although the baddies, actually. Mm. Oh, the baddies are good. <laughs> So anyway, what does the new place or time or environment add to the premise? Mm, For example, the movie version of Richard III with Ian Uh, McKellen that took place in a a fascist early World War II, pre-World War II European world. Mm. It made a lot of sense. It made Richard's hunger for power extremely clear. Didn't it just? (laughs) Yeah. On the other hand, I was, I never saw, but was made aware of a version of Julius Caesar (gasps) that took place in like a samurai world. What? (laughs) And it's unclear if it was supposed to be from a a samurai movie world, like a Kurosawa film, Mm. or if it was supposed to be actually feudal Japan. Wow. Okay. Um, it made a lot of people angry. Mm-hmm. This was a theater production in Philadelphia some years ago, and the director thought it would look cool to produce Julius Caesar in feudal Japan, mm-hmm. looking like a Kurosawa movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and it made a lot of people angry mm-hmm. because Japanese people in the Sengoku era don't play by the same rules as ancient Romans. Yeah. Never mind English people writing about what they imagine ancient Romans to be like. <laughs> and they didn't cast any actual Asians, oh. let alone Japanese people. Oh. Do your research. Yeah, that sounds like fingers down a chalkboard kind of adaptation to me. <laughs> yeah, it was very painful for everyone. Yeah. So don't use a particular place or time unless it's really going to bolster the basic premise of your story and if you are going to put it in a particular space and time do your research absolutely know what it's like so yeah it was very painful for everyone so to the exercise hooray are you ready folks to note this task down do once upon a time i had to make visual collages for an adaptation of the rocking horse winner by dh lawrence as i was getting ready to do that So it had, for example, an adorable child's bedroom with a rocking horse. But outside the windows, there were these black galloping stallion silhouettes against a red sky. 
If you're not familiar with The Rocking Horse Winter by D.H. Lawrence, go read it. It's a wonderful story. Your local library should definitely have it. It's very good. What if you could make a sound collage of everything relevant to the story that you're trying to tell, but without dialogue? What would be the music playlist? Mm -hmm. Make a playlist of pieces of music that convey what you want to get across in terms of what you want the audience to feel, in terms of source material, things like that. Consider period, place, etc. This isn't going to be something to be put in your podcast, so you don't have to worry about copyright. It's going to be something for your own inspiration. Right. If you really want to be inspired, make a sound collage of sound effects that convey the premise of the story that you want to tell. Oh, yes. Yeah. So let's say you're writing an audio drama mm-hmm. and the premise is just say no to drugs. Yes. And the producer is paying you to adapt Snow White oh. to take place in Laurel Canyon in California in 1967 with that premise. Okay. What songs would you put on your inspirational playlist? And what sounds would you put in your inspirational sound collage? Mine. Well, yes, yours too, but mostly mostly the listener. But yeah, oh, go ahead. Good, because I, I, I don't actually know where, where, where Laurel Canyon is. <laughs> is it next to Hardy Canyon by chance? No. Okay. Uh, so uh, Snow White, yes, 1967. Well, say no to drugs. Okay, Laurel and Hardy Canyon. Okay, my go-to music would be anything from The Stones, uh-huh, a bit of Jefferson Airplane, White Rabbit, some small faces, a little Dylan, and of course a little cheeky, cheeky bit of The Beatles. Uh, probably some Tomorrow Never Knows, actually, as Snow White is uh, like, you know, in the eternal sleep that isn't sleep when she mm-hmm. bites the apple. Oh, it's fun. I might write this now. The artist that we would be thinking about that poem would be more like Carol King, <gasps> Crosby, Stills and Nash, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, that really California oh, yeah. mellow deal. Joni Mitchell. Um, yeah, California also had like a jazz and blues scene to a certain extent. So, mm. you know, that's uh, something to think about too. Nice. True. Okay. So sound effects uh, would be uh, mining the might, a sturdy horse steed, some magical transformation effects, perhaps some happy animals, sounds of nature, oh, oh palpitating, palpitating heartbeats of how, um, you know, Snow White is uh, affected by the, the poison mm-hmm. in the apple and uh, and a kiss. Yes. But ugh, audio drama kisses sound gross, don't they? When you have to kiss your, kiss your yeah, yeah, that's Ugh. weird. Sorry. That's really uncomfortable. I'm going to do that ever again. So knowing that Laurel Canyon is in Southern California. Yes. Uh, what about sounds that you would be likely to hear there? Like Ooh. their birds. Yes. Their kind Indigenous of animals. Indigenous animals, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, or the accents of how people speak. Mm-hmm. Okay. Things like that. Good. Uh, yeah, on the levels of tension, that's number two, isn't it? You're Californian for theatrical people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> Groovy. So it's a it's a good start. Just yeah. keep keep brainstorming, Sarah, and I'll do the outro. Oh, okay, so okay, stormy nights in the canyon rolling over and, and the rain and the evil character appears and, and happy forest sounds when when the I'm the, just gonna leave her to it. I just hope she doesn't overheat. Well, thank you for listening, folks. We hope this has been food for thought. If you're wanting to do your own adaptations, feel free to send us any of your work on the exercises we set. We'd love to celebrate your creativity here on AdWit. Ping any of that to writersadwit at gmail.com. And happy writing! Oh, yes, uh, I am happy and I am writing! Hooray! Hooray! Lucky folks have been listening to the Audio Drama Writers Independent Toolkit, hosted by Sarah Golding and Lindsay Harris Friel. Audio engineering, sound design, and music. Gorgeous music by Vincent Friel. Huzzahs! If you enjoyed what you heard, oh, please do write us a review on Podchaser or on Apple Podcasts or any podcatcher, quite frankly. We'd love to hear what you think. Or you can tweet about us if you like. Yes, our Twitter handle is at Adwit Podcast. And please do keep in touch. We'd love to know how you're getting on with all the exercises and more. Or if you just want to say hello, do that too. You can write to us at writers adwit at gmail.com and for more information about what we're doing and what we're up to and how visit our website at adwit.org thank you very much for listening people i hope you have a good day take care bye adwit is created and recorded on the unceded land of the lenny lenape nation to learn more about the lenape their history and their culture please visit their website at lenape nation.org
6630 Productions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.